and in the presence of the saints to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Amen. So, beloved, I bring you your greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. If you have your Bibles with you today, I would ask that you turn with me to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to be looking at chapter 2. Chapter 2, verses 3 to 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 to 6. So everyone can signal that they have that by saying amen. I'm going to read from the NASB. I'll begin reading. This is what the Word of God says. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, Mm -hmm. But God who examines our hearts. Right. Come on, come on. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. Mm -hmm. God is witness. Right. Nor did we seek glory from men, yeah. either from you mm -hmm. or from others. Yeah. Even though as apostles of Christ, well, we might have asserted our authority. Amen. May be seated in the presence of the Lord. And we are continuing this particular series entitled Entrusted with the Gospel. Entrusted with the Gospel. And beloved, there's a there's a story of a church, a church building that had ivory growing on the sides of the church. And at the top of the church, outside the entrance, there was a sign which read, We Preach Christ Crucified. This church had a long line of, of godly pastors who, in fact, preached Christ crucified. This godly line of pastors preached what the sign on the outside said. Yet, beloved, as more time began to pass, the ivy began to grow over the sign and obscure its message. And so the sign went from we preach Christ crucified to we preach Christ. And then, beloved, as more time began to pass, more ivy grew over the sign, and all you could see is, is we preach. We preach. Until finally the, the ivy grew and obscured the sign so much that all one could see as they entered the church for worship is we. Yeah. And what was happening to the church sign outside, I believe, beloved, is parallel to what was happening to the church inside. Yeah. And sadly, what is happening outside many a local church today come on, come on. is happening on the inside of many local churches today. Mm -hmm. Beloved, what I mean is, is the church has began to surrender it's called to preach Christ crucified mm -hmm. and ultimately has lost its ability to discern truth from error. Yes, 
Beloved, I believe the church has lost sight of what God has entrusted her to be. Well. Of what God has entrusted her to do. And that is, beloved, make the gospel visible for all the world to see. And the world, by seeing the gospel, repents and believes. As you know, our nation is in a watershed moment in time. Either our nation is going to look the evils of oppression and injustice in the eye and defeat it mm -hmm. or our nation is going to be overcome with evil. Nah. And beloved, the church more than, than any time in this modern era needs, or this nation more than any time in this modern era needs the church. Come on, man. come on, tell it. And so for the church to sit passively by and accept evil and injustice as the status quo mm -hmm. makes her become complicit. Amen. It was MLK who said in his book, Stride Toward Freedom. He who accepts evil without protesting against it is really cooperating with it. Oh, and in a time of civil unrest, such as the time that we are living in today, this nation needs the church. Yes, sir. This nation needs the church to guide it through the rushing waves of civil unrest. And more important, beloved, the, the, the church needs biblical leadership, and I put the emphasis on biblical leadership to guide her mm -hmm. in order to prevent the shipwrecking of the faith of many. Well, yes, the greatest need for the church at this hour is biblical leadership that derives its purpose not from secular means of protest, mm -hmm. which there's nothing wrong with that, not by secular means of protest against injustice, but gospel means. Well. Gospel means a protest against injustice, oppression, amidst all the civil unrest that we see before our very eyes. Yes, we got to speak up Yes, sir. For the voiceless. Mm -hmm. We got to speak out against oppression wherever it raises its ugly head. Mm -hmm. But remember, beloved, our, our protest has to be cross centered. Mm -hmm. Our protest has to be cross shaped mm -hmm. if we're going to remain faithful to Scripture. Tell it. Because cross shape, cross Center protest is non-violent protest. Cross-centered, cross-shaped protest is gospel-centered protest. And as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must declare the only hope this world needs. Mm -hmm. That is our blessed hope, Jesus Christ. Word. As followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must be an example to the world of what a reconciled community looks like. Man. After all, Sunday is still the most segregated day in America. And so, beloved, we got to use the gospel to tear down the walls that divide us. Yes, the church has got to be a church without walls. Yeah, walls erected on the basis of moralism. Erected on the basis Walls erected on the basis of, of racism. All of those walls are antithetical to the gospel message we preach. Mm -hmm. Because moralism is not the gospel. Yeah. See, the gospel is not about mere behavior modification. Yeah. We're not looking to change just people's behavior. Yeah. We want their hearts to be changed. Yeah. Change a person's heart. Come on, right? Classism is not the gospel. Come on, come on. Because
because we ought not to include or exclude people on the basis of how much they have well, or how much they don't have. Mm -hmm. Racism is not the gospel. Sadly, beloved, we have individuals who are taking the sacred name of Jesus upon their lips and saying they, they, they follow the Lord Jesus Christ. They become apologists for the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. One such gentleman, I was reading one of his posts and he had the nerve to say that hate crimes cannot be found in the Bible. And I got to thinking to myself, I was like, isn't hate a sin? Mm. <laughs> so, Lord, we can't hide behind doctrine as a cloak for what we really want in our hearts or what we really think about other people from different people groups. Mm -hmm. Beloved, we've got to recapture a biblical worldview about race you utilizing an imago day and a one blood ethos. In Genesis 1, 26 to 27, I'm reminded that the word of God says all human beings have been made in the image of God. And if all human beings have been made in the image of God, it gives us no right to defile the image of God, to, to, to disrespect the image of God, to kill the image of, of God. Amen. On the basis of uh, the melanin count or the lack thereof in somebody's skin complexion. Well. Acts 17 to 26 says God has made from one blood from one man. We all have Adam as our father. From one blood, every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed time. Well. And boundaries of their habitation. We've got to embrace our oneness in the gospel. Secured by the death of Christ on the cross and his bodily resurrection. We, beloved, as the church, have to be a visible example of what it looks like to remove the rot of racism in our society and in the church. We got to show the world what Christ centered. What a Christ-centered, reconciled community looks like. Mm -hmm. After all, it's we who have been entrusted with the gospel. Yeah, yes, and when we come to the text that is before us today, we see what happens when a church is guided by biblical leadership. Mm -hmm. Because when we encounter the church of the Thessalonians, we find them living faithfully in the face of opposition. We find them living faithfully in the face of difficulty and even at times uh, civil wars. Well, you recall they had been birthed out of difficult circumstances. There was uh, civil unrest when this church came in to being. Because when Paul came to that town, he, he was his custom and he went to the local synagogue and he preached the gospel. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that again. When Paul came to town, he went to the local synagogue as it was his custom and he preached mm -hmm. the gospel. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say it again for the folk in the back who cannot hear. When, when Paul Yes, sir. <laughs> it was his custom to go to the local synagogue mm -hmm. and preach mm -hmm. the gospel. Oh, come on. And after Paul preached the gospel, 
There were some individuals who got saved. Mm -hmm. After Paul preached the gospel, there was a mob that, that rose up against him. And they went looking for the apostle Paul. They went trying to, to find the apostle Paul. And, and when they couldn't find him, they, they, they went to a man's house by the name of Jason. Looking for the apostle Paul. And since Paul wasn't there, they drug Jason out. And took him before the magistrates. And they told the magistrates, listen to this very clear. That they said that there's a group in town. There's a, there's a man in town. Well. Who's preaching this message that Caesar is not king. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well. he's, he's preaching this message that there is another king. And he's got people following after him. Mm -hmm. They were preaching that there was another king by the name of Jesus. Yes, sir. And beloved, let us not forget amidst what we are seeing before our very eyes each and every day that there is another king besides Caesar. And we have to preach it. Another message that there is another king and his name is Jesus. So Jason had to pay a fine. He had to pay bail to get out of the situation that he was in. But, but Paul left Thessalonica and he went to Berea. These individuals even followed him to Berea. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, while Paul was in Berea, there was a vacuum that was left in this young church. And there were some individuals who had arisen and they began to tear down Paul's character. They began to, to, to persuade or try to persuade rather the saints of Thessalonica that Paul was not worthy of following. Come on, come on, tell it. And we, beloved, should all be striving to be leaders, the kind of Christians that are worthy of following. Man. We should be the kind of churches that are striving to be churches that are worthy of following. So Paul, he, he writes back to this church what we have before us. He writes this letter to this church of the Thessalonians in order to counter what was being said. Mm -hmm. Because whenever somebody rises up to try to persuade you from following the Lord Jesus Christ, it's usually going to be resulting in you going into a dead end. Come on. Mm -hmm. But remember, the church not only needs biblical leadership well, worth following. The church, again, has to be the kind of church that is worth following. Mm -hmm. And actually, beloved, there are many of us who are in some form of leadership. Mm -hmm. If you are a parent, you are in some form of leadership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're a parent, you are a leader. And as a parent, we have to teach our children, well, yes, about protests. we got to teach our children about the history of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. we got to teach our children about the history of oppression that has occurred in this nation. Mm -hmm. But we got to teach our children about Jesus as well. Yes. Come on, man. Amen. yes. We've got to teach our kids about Jesus. If you are a grandparent, Come on. I want you to know today that you are a leader. And if you are a Christian grandparent, as well as a Christian parent, you need to teach your grandkids about the history of oppression and and, and you have to teach your grandkids about the history of the civil rights movement. But we also got to teach our grandkids about Jesus. And the reason why I say this, beloved, is because I am I'm afraid. 
I'm afraid that we have some parents, mm -hmm. Christian parents, I'm speaking to Christian parents who take their children to protest, mm -hmm. but they won't take their children to church. Come on, doctor. Right. I, I'm afraid, beloved, that we have some Christian parents that will teach their kids mm -hmm. about the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. about the legacy and the history of slavery, that, but they will not teach or take or bring their children to church. They will not bring their children to Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid, beloved, that we have parents, Christian parents, that are taking their children to protest and learn how to, in order to learn how to bow a knee to the high ideals of what's being protested about, but yet won't teach their children to bow a knee to Jesus. Word, dog. Yeah, we got to protest, indeed. But we can't forget about Jesus. Amen. Because regardless, or if we are in the pew, we've got to remember that we've been entrusted with the gospel. And so as we trek our way through these three verses, mm -hmm. just three verses, it's going to be helpful for us to hang our thoughts on, I just lifted three C words, of character, calling, and commitment. Character, calling, and commitment. We must be People of character mm -hmm. based upon truth, purity, and integrity. We must understand that our calling is from God. Yeah. And we've got to be faithful to our calling. And we must be committed to the glory of God alone. We're not looking for photo ops. Mm. <laughs> Teach up. We're not looking to pose. For the media so they can see us holding Bibles in our hands or being downtown protesting just so folk can see that we we got some street cred. That's that's not what we're trying to do. <laughs> we're doing this for the glory of God. Regarding our character, we've got to understand that character is who we are when nobody is looking. Amen. And character is who we are when everybody is looking. I like that, dog. And Paul was a man of high character. Mm -hmm. And we know Paul was a man of high character based upon what he said in verse 3. Look closely with me. He said, for our exhortation does not come from error, or impurity, or by way of deceit. Do you see that? Right. There, there are four words in there that I think that are worth underlining and highlighting for us. Exhortation, error, impurity, and deceit. Mm -hmm. See, encouragement, beloved, is the act of calling to one side, and we must passionately Call people to salvation. We must passionately stand on the truth of God's word. We must call the world mm -hmm. to repent and believe the gospel. But notice the text says error. And error means wandering away from the truth mm -hmm. as found in scripture. And beloved, we have many a preacher today that has abandoned the truth. Well, we have many a Christian today that has abandoned and wandered away from the truth. And if we're going to be people of character, we got to stay tight to the truth. If we're going to be people of character, we cannot teach error. Well, Listen, telling the gospel is a passionate plea. It's not about giving speeches. If you can get up and stand before people and, and tell people speeches, even if you read scripture, mm -hmm. and your speech sounds the same way 
with or without scripture. You don't really even need scripture because <laughs> scripture is just basically a prop for you to get up and tell people what you really want to tell them anyway. Come on. And if you can say what you say without using God's word, then what does that say about our preaching? We must be those who proclaim the truth. Well, nothing but the truth that is found in Christ Jesus alone. Because Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. Come on, come on. No one can come to the Father except by him. There's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved, and that name is Jesus. And so Paul had character because he didn't teach error. He wasn't wandering away from the truth. Paul had character because he was not impure. Well, Look again at the word. The word there is impure. And impurity, it refers to uncleanliness. Defilement that that comes from an impure heart, and those who teach a false gospel. My God. Never forget this: those who teach a false gospel are always marked by impurity. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. Spiritual charlatans always have a trail of scandals following behind them because their hearts are impure. And if we want to be a church that's worth following, if we want to be a leader that is worth following, if we want to be a Christian who is worth following, then we can't have impure motives. Paul had character because he didn't teach error. Well, wasn't running away from the truth. Paul had character because uh, he was not impure. And Paul had character because he was a person of integrity. Notice in the text that the text says the word deceit. De deceit. And the opposite of deceit is integrity. Listen, Paul was not a wolf in sheep's clothing. Well, we got plenty of wolves in pulpits. Paul wasn't trying to lure the church of the Thessalonians into another gospel. And neither should we. Because the word picture of deceit is someone baiting a hook. Well, Those of you all who like to fish. And the only problem is, is when you bait a hook. The person who sees the bait does not see the hook. Well. And the gospel message <laughs> is not a bait used to hook people into following a different Jesus. Yeah, yeah, come on, dog. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Yeah. One who believes. So as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. we have a responsibility to speak the truth. Speak the truth in love without deception. Oh my God. We don't manipulate people with gimmicks. We don't manipulate people with the acts. We're not trying to, to, to manipulate people by unbiblical tactics. Mm -hmm. After all, our calling is from God. Amen. Let's look again at at the word of God in verse 4. Because when we look at verse 4, what we see is, is the word of God says, but just as we have been approved by God mm -hmm. to be entrusted with the gospel. So we speak not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. Man. Paul was approved. And what that basically means is Paul had been tested. And after being tested, Paul had been entrusted. Come on. After being tested, 
after being entrusted, Paul was used as an instrument in the Redeemer's hands. Well, I'm reminded of my own ordination and calling. See, we in the old church, when you say you was called by God, mm -hmm. folk would watch you. You go through a season of testing. My pastor, uh, Pastor Lockridge, he, I remember it vividly when I went before him and I told him, I said, you know, Pastor, I believe the Lord has called me to ministry. Pastor Lockridge looked at me and smiled and uh, he said, you know what, I'm not going to get in the Lord's way. And he pulled out his calendar, Amen. put me on the schedule to preach. And then he went out and preached. And after he preached his message, he brought me up before the people and said, this man right here says he's been called by God. Mm -hmm. Now, you have a responsibility to watch him, to watch his life, to watch his doctrine closely. Mm -hmm. Then, after I was licensed to preach the gospel. I was ordained to preach the gospel in the same church. And there were godly men who put their necks on the line for me. Mm -hmm. Yes, they didn't just give me a certificate. You know, you can, you can order a certificate online mm -hmm. and pay a certain fee mm -hmm. to become a minister. They didn't, they didn't do me like that. They tested me. Mm -hmm. They critiqued me. They brought me for a group of witnesses who could declare and certify that I had been called by God. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to say today, beloved, is when I stand before you each week, Come on, I'm standing on the shoulders of men who had enough faith in God and believed enough in me that I was called to preach the gospel. They tested me. So every preacher must understand that when you have been tested, mm -hmm. you have been entrusted with the gospel and you cannot turn back from declaring what the gospel says. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. You can't put your hand to the gospel plow and then look back. Because ultimately, it's going to be God who's going to examine our hearts. Yeah, God is going to examine our hearts. His examination is ultimately what's going to count. And let's be honest, we'll never be able to please people enough. You'll never be able to measure up to, to other folks' expectations enough. But beloved, we've got to let mm -hmm. what God thinks about us shape us. More so than what other folks say about us shake us. Mm -hmm. See, the Lord is the one yes, he is. who's going to examine your heart. Mm -hmm. So we got to obey the Lord rather than men. That's right. Because it's to him that we must give an account. That's right. Amen. It's our calling to fulfill. It's our calling to do the master's will. Mm -hmm. Finally, beloved, as I draw near to my close, we've got to be committed to the glory of God alone. Mm -hmm. Look again at verses 5 and 6, where the word of God says, For we never came with, with flattering speech, as you know, and, 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 you know, always pay attention to words that are repeatedly said in the text, as you know. As you know, it's something that keeps on popping up 
So, so Paul is, is basing what he's saying upon what they saw in him. Yeah. As you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor do we seek glory from men either. From you or from others. Even though as apostles of Christ, mm -hmm. we might have asserted our authority. My God. That's rich below. We, we have this, this time that has been allotted to us. This season in our lives to vigorously proclaim the gospel of our God. And what we have been witnessing is going to be game changing as far as our nation is concerned when it comes to public protesting. Yet, beloved, while we vigorously proclaim the gospel of our God and, and witness what is occurring in our nation, we've got to be committed to the glory of God more than any time in our lives. Uh -huh. The reason why I say that is because everything Paul did was for the glory of God. Really? Yes, and notice again that the text says, or it uses the word flattery, and it uses the word greed. And you all know what flattery is, right? Yeah, flattery is just complimenting someone as a means of getting something from them. Yeah. <laughs> you, you tell them something nice because uh, you want something from them. You got a motive behind it. You got, you got a trick up your sleeve. Yeah. So Paul, he did not use flattery when he came to them. And neither was he greedy. Mm. Paul wasn't in it for the money, y'all. Come on, dog. He wasn't trying to take advantage of anybody. He wasn't hiding his real plans under the cloak of greed. Paul was transparent. And he calls God as his witness. Mm -hmm. As to whether or not he was living the gospel. Well, God, beloved, as witness, is not simply a spectator in our lives. Because God is able to testify about us. Mm -hmm. God, as witness, he knows all. Well, and he sees all. And he cannot lie. Yes, God as witness judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart mm -hmm. as well as the motives. And one day God is going to testify. Yeah. Yes, he will. He's going to testify against us as to whether or not we were preoccupied with serving him or serving ourselves. But notice again in the text that Paul was an apostle. He was a real deal apostle. <laughs> we got a lot of folks walking around today calling themselves apostle so-and-so and apostle this and apostle that. Come on, come on. But they're not real deal apostles. Paul was a real deal apostle called on the road to Damascus. Jesus himself appointed the apostle Paul as an apostle. As a messenger for him. And as an apostle, he didn't abuse his authority. Yeah. Mm. Beloved, when we are in churches where authority is being abused, it creates a toxic environment. Yeah. It creates an environment Three. where people's faith is shipwrecked. Three. We got people today who do not attend church well, because they were under an abusive authority system in their local church. Preach. And so now all they do is sit at 
home. So, beloved, we should not have an abusive and toxic atmosphere here. Because we want folk to feel as though when they come up in here, they are encountering a people who are pure, a people who are not greedy, a people who don't have an ulterior motive except to love them. So as verse 6 says, he was not seeking the glory of men, which he kind of unpacked in verse 4 already. Mm -hmm. But I want to emphasize this point because if we don't follow Jesus, and if we don't follow him faithfully, then you can't be following Jesus and expecting a pat on the back from those who are in the world as well. You can't straddle the fence when it comes to following Jesus. Either you're going to serve him or not. Whose side are you on? You need to choose this day whom you going to serve. If you're going to serve the gods of this world, then go serve them. But if you're going to serve Jesus, you need to serve him. Whom you serve him. Word, dog. You got to understand that you're not serving him so that you can get the glory. Yeah. We don't serve Jesus so that we can get the glory. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. The world has some glory for you. The world has some earthly glory for you. But the earthly glory has no eternal value. Yeah. There are men, women, boys, and girls today that are getting a lot of earthly glory. Uh -huh. CNN is in their face. Fox is in their face. CBS is in their face. Uh, uh, NBC is in their face. They're getting all the glory. They're getting money. They're getting paid. Mm -hmm. But all of that is going to burn up yeah. in the presence of God's glory. Beloved, earthly glory has no eternal value, but eternal glory is what we're after. Amen. We've been called to an eternal glory, Amen. and we've got to be committed Amen. to doing everything we do, whether it's protesting, or whether it's at home, or whether it's at work. We've got to be doing everything for the glory of God. Oh my God. The Westminster well, the Westminster Shorter Catechism says it this way. It asks the question, what is the chief end of man? Mm -hmm. And then it answers the question by saying the chief end of man is to glorify God and forever. Mm -hmm. What this answer reveals, beloved, is our purpose in life. For running around trying to find their purpose. Your purpose in life is to glorify God with your life. Oh my God. The Bible says it this way. Whether you eat, drink, or whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And what I'm trying to say is, is we cannot escape the fact that we've been called to give God glory. Tell it. Oh, yeah, we've been saved for his glory. We've been redeemed for his glory. And we ought to live our lives for his glory. Because all the glory belongs to God. And God deserves all the glory. And he will not share his glory with another. If I can make it plain for you, every breath that you take is for the glory of God. Every step that you take is for the glory of God. Every time you wake up in the morning, it's for the glory of God. If you're here today, if you're here today and you've got a reasonable portion of health and strength, don't you know it's for the glory of God? If you're saved today, don't you know you're moving from glory to glory? Come on. Because God's glory. Is in a class all by itself. Yes, sir. There's nothing that is comparable to God's glory. Because his glory began in eternity. Mm -hmm. And is going to end in eternity. Yes, his glory was seen in Christ Jesus, who is the hope of glory. 
Oh, yes, it was. Mm -hmm. Because I'm reminded that he was crucified for the glory of God the Father. He was buried to the glory of God the Father. He was raised on the third appointed day to the glory of God the Father. Yes. And he knows the glory. Ascended yes, sir. gloriously. And don't you all know that one day he's going to return yeah, that, right. gloriously? Yes, he and is. his glory is going to continue. Yes. Even when he returns, because he's the king of glory. Mm -hmm. He's the king eternal. Mm -hmm. He's the king immortal. Yeah. He's king invisible. Mm -hmm. He's the only wise yes. God. Yes. My God. And to him belong honor and glory. Amen. So, mm. love, we've got a responsibility today. Come on. We've got a responsibility to proclaim the glory of his name. Yes, sir. We've got a responsibility to pro proclaim glory to his name. Glory because we've been wondrously saved from sin. Glory yeah. because his name is above every name. Glory because in his name there is salvation. Glory because his name is a redeeming name. Glory because his name is a reconciling name. Yeah. Mm. Glory. That's good, dog. Because his name is a healing name. This nation will be healed yes, once it bows to the name of Jesus. Yeah. Glory because his name is a delivering name. Mm. And so, beloved, it's incumbent upon us who are called by his name to bless his name. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. Yes, sir. For there is a name yeah. that we love mm -hmm. to hear. Yes, sir. A name that we love to sing its words. Mm -hmm. It sounds like music in our ear because it's the sweetest name mm -hmm. on earth. Yes. And that name is Jesus. Jesus. Yes. Ah. Amen. So beloved, that's the message for the day. I want to encourage us to be people of character. I want to encourage us to not only be people of character, but be the kind of people who are going to be faithful Amen. to our calling. And not only be people of character, people who are faithful to our calling, but be the kind of people who are going to be committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. May the Lord bless you. So, beloved, we come to a point in time in our service where if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Amen. So if you're willing to confess him as Savior and Lord, God will save you. There's no secret what God can do.